Good morning slash afternoon slash evening or whenever you're watching this Devo. Today we will be looking into 2 Corinthians 3 and the truths that Paul brings to all of us while addressing the Corinthian church. This chapter starts off a little weird. It starts with a condescending question. Let's real quick look at verse 1. Maybe you saw it too. He says this, are we, begin are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Do, or do we need some letters of commendation for you? It's, it really is a weird way to start off. My wife often says to me, um, Neil, you're not listening to me, are you? And I still think that's a weird way to start off a conversation. And this is a weird way to start off a chapter. But here's the deal. We have to remember that these are not originally written. This, this book is not originally written in chapters, but in letters. All of 2 Corinthians is just one letter. The Bible wasn't divided into chapters or verses until 1227 by an Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton. And he did it to help us find scriptures more quickly and easily. It's much easier to find John chapter 3, verse 16 than it is to find, uh, for God so loved the world. And every once in a while in these chapter breaks, there's one that's placed poorly like we see right here. So we find this question actually in the middle of the letter and thus relating to what he had just been talking about in the last chapter. So when, when we look at chapter 2, what he was talking about was us being the fragrant aroma of Christ and that people should know our authenticity by our actions. Now let's go to where we are again in verses 1 through 3. He's addressing a problem that reaffirms our lives being assigned to others. See, there was a problem arising in which false teachers had started carrying forged letters of recommendation to authenticate their authority. Paul makes it clear that he needed no such letters. And that is why he says in verse 2 um, that, let me read it real quick, he says, You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifest that you are the letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. Paul is saying that we are the letters of authenticity. In the last chapter, he said we are the fragrant aroma of Christ. He says we carry Christ's scent. When someone has perfume or cologne on, you notice it immediately, and people should notice our devotion to Christ in the same manner. Now he says that we are a letter that is written and read by men. Not just, I'm sorry, not just any letter, a letter written by Christ for men. Every action you take or don't take is a part of that letter that all men read. I think it's probably safe to say that most of us can spot a real, real Christian following God from, from one that moderately follows God without asking them anything about their commitment level to God. We see it in the letter that they are, the smell that they give. It's in the joy they possess or don't, the morals they have that don't change with society's influence or are dictated by society's desires by the convictions that they stand for or by the preferences that they lay aside when convenient, by the kindness, the love, and compassion that just isn't normal. People know you by the letter you are. What kind of letter are you? You may be on your way to work right now. What kind of letter do you present to the people at your workplace? What about your friends? Are you the letter that encourages them to follow God more intently? As people are around you, are they inspired to grow closer to God? When people read you, what is it that they read? Now, even though this may seem a little bit daunting to try to be this perfect letter to people, Paul gives us hope in verses 4 and 5. He says this, he says, Such confidence we have through Christ towards God that not not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. And this is great because the honest truth is that left up to our own confidence and adequacies, we would be pretty poor letters to others. Many people around the world are trying so hard to gain confidence. When we turn on the television or the radio or look on social media, 
we're constantly bombarded with suggestions on how to become a self-sufficient, competent, uh, confident, capable, well-adjusted person. There are all kinds of approaches and almost all work on the same basis. That confidence has to come from within you. You have, so, you have to somehow find in yourself the power to achieve, to be successful. And your biggest problem is that you don't believe in yourself enough. And people who lack confidence are usually unsure of themselves and insecure and they go bumbling through life. Therefore, the great thing that we need to aim is to build up a deep sense of confidence. However, this is interesting. However, the, the new covenant that Paul is talking about right here is entirely different from anything the world knows about. Paul was saying that his confidence does not come from within, but from without. It comes from God. It's not about Paul's inadequacies, but about God's adequacy working in Paul's life. The old covenant is Paul trying to do his best on behalf of God, but this new covenant is God doing his best through Paul. What a difference. This is the great truth we need to learn. Don't get stuck, stuck in the old covenant of trying to follow the rules that point you to Christ. Christ has already come so that we could live, he could live inside of us and help us become more like him. The more that you enter into friendship with God, the more of his letter you become and the easier it is to live by the Spirit. In verse 9, he says this, he says, For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, Paul is saying that the old covenant, the ministry of condemnation, had its glory, and it did. Just imagine the glory of the new covenant, the ministry of righteousness. The old covenant of the law was good because it pointed us to Jesus in the new covenant. Now, you may be thinking this. What does this have to do with me? I'm already part of the new covenant. Well, here's the deal. I've watched many, many people enter into the new covenant of God with God, yet still leave their mind in the old covenant. They live their Christianity as a set of rules and regulations uh, that they must follow, and they have left the heart of God for procedures and guidelines and rules. When you live by the do's and don'ts of the Bible, you lose the spirit of God and become burned out and lost in your own inadequacy to follow him fully. When you give yourself into the relationship with God where you invite him to change you from inside out, you find that he gives his strength where you are weak. The Bible says this in one of my favorite scriptures. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things will be added to you. And he really means that. When you put yourself where he is, when you walk according to his spirit, you enter into his help. Verse 17 ends us with this. Now the spirit, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom from striving, freedom from bondage, and freedom from the insufficiencies of the old covenant. We're free to live in the power of Christ and Him crucified. I want to challenge you today to do something that will change your life. I want you to pray to God today and ask Him, tell Him that you want to walk according to His Spirit today. That you want to, you want to become a friends with God, that you desire His closeness. Ask Him to make you a great letter to be read by all men.